The series, adapted from Jules Verne's classic novel 20,000 Leagues Under the Seas, follows Captain Nemo on an extraordinary undersea journey. Set in the 19th century, the story begins in the Indian Ocean, where a sea monster attacks a merchant ship. Captain Youngblood, eager for profit, pursues the creature. However, they quickly realize it's far larger than expected. Before retreating, the monster destroys their ship, leaving them stranded. To their shock, it's not a beast, but a massive submarine. From the hatch emerges Captain Nemo, the enigmatic commander of the Nautilus. Previously, Nemo had been a penal laborer in a British colony, working on a secret ship. When the time came, he and his comrades overpowered their captors, taking control of the vessel. In a fierce struggle, they cut the ship's moorings amidst a hail of gunfire. Despite casualties, they managed to launch the Nautilus, securing their freedom. Now in command of the submarine, Captain Nemo embarks on a voyage across the world's oceans, leaving behind a life of enslavement and forging a new path beneath the waves. As the Nautilus broke free, it began its thrilling journey, 20,000 leagues under the sea. The crew, led by designer Benoit, quickly adapted to their roles, guiding the submarine deeper into the ocean. On shore, guards fired in vain, unable to damage the Nautilus. At the helm, Nemo navigated through dangerous underwater crevices, knowing a single collision could be fatal. Fortunately, they emerged into open water, though the East India Company would surely pursue them. As oxygen dwindled in the cabin, Nemo prepared to surface. Suddenly, a merchant ship mistook the Nautilus for a whale and attacked. Nemo retaliated, ramming the ship at full speed. However, on its first dive, the Nautilus suffered a turbine malfunction during the attack. Though they destroyed the ship, the submarine sustained significant damage. Nemo rescued the women and children from the wrecked vessel and set the captured guards adrift. After a tense exchange, the Nautilus submerged again. Nemo planned to head to the North Sea to search for a lost Spanish treasure. However, Benoit suggested they first stop at a French port for repairs and supplies. The North Sea seemed unreachable, with food running low and additional passengers on board. Lucas, anxious after overhearing the plan, confronted Nemo. She had been en route to Mumbai to find her fiancé but was abducted by Nemo. Now, fearing for her life, she demanded answers. Their tense conversation was interrupted by a strange noise. Sperm whales were surrounding the submarine. The crew was mesmerized, but Nemo sensed danger. Rushing to the engine room, they discovered they had descended over a hundred meters, and the turbine had failed. If they didn't fix it quickly, the deep-sea pressure would crush them long before they ran out of air. Lucas claimed she could fix the turbine at a critical moment, but Nemo hesitated to trust her. As the hull creaked under deep-sea pressure, Nemo set aside his pride, and Lucas took charge. She instructed the crew to create a makeshift pressure valve. They cranked the lever desperately, but the Nautilus still didn't rise. The frantic efforts depleted oxygen, leaving everyone dizzy, including the dog. Lucas, staying relatively clear-headed, suspected a leak. Amidst the crew's labored breathing, she detected a faint hissing sound. Tearing off part of her skirt, she soaked it in oil and wrapped it around the leaking pipe with Nemo's help. The repair held, and the crew used their remaining strength to bring the Nautilus to the surface. As they breathed in the fresh air, thoughts of returning to the land grew. The crew, still a makeshift team with limited resources, began considering leaving. Lucas and the female caretaker packed their bags and, seeing land nearby, jumped into the water, followed by two Indian crew members. Nemo watched helplessly, unable to stop them. Soon, a squad of guards arrived on shore, alerted by the East India Company. They commandeered boats and chased the escapees. Realizing the danger, Lucas turned back to the Nautilus. She knew the East India Company wouldn't spare anyone to reclaim the submarine. Meanwhile, the Nautilus suddenly lost all power. Nemo and Benoit searched for the cause, but found nothing. Lucas returned and calmly removed a wire she had previously tampered with to ensure her escape. Frustrated but with no time to dwell on it, Nemo refocused on fleeing the guards. As the crew resumed their stations, the Nautilus began to sink, leaving the guards on shore watching helplessly as the vessel disappeared beneath the sea. Though they had escaped the immediate threat, Nemo knew maintaining morale among the crew would be challenging, as coercion wasn't his way. As Nemo pondered his next move, 
an opportunity arose. A whaling ship used a young whale as bait to catch a giant sperm whale, causing a moral dilemma among the crew. Initially, Nemo didn't want to intervene, but a comment from the female crew member Suyin made him reconsider. Mother leading them away from her calf. The Nautilus surged from the water at Nemo's command, startling the whalers. Before they could react, Nemo leaped from the deck towards the harpooned mother whale. The whalers retaliated with shotguns, but the Nautilus crew united. The first mate controlled the submarine's distance while the sailors fired shots to buy Nemo time. Nemo cut the rope, grabbed the harpoon, and sank with the whale into the depths. Shortly after, he returned with the harpoon, boosting the crew's morale as they experienced the power of teamwork. Riding the victory, Nemo tried to convince the whalers to release the whale calf, but they refused, as their livelihood depended on it. With no money, Nemo impulsively threw Lucas's gold bracelet to the fisherman, settling a score with her and honoring her earlier agreement to save the whales. However, the bracelet was a keepsake from Lucas's father, and Nemo regretted his impulsiveness, vowing to make amends. Their interference drew the attention of the East India Company, which sent the Fearless, a steel warship, to pursue them. Equipped with sonic detectors, the Fearless could detect the Nautilus underwater. Nemo ordered the crew to shut down the engines, hoping to avoid detection. However, while Nemo could silence his crew, he couldn't silence the dog. The Nautilus was discovered, and the soldiers on the Fearless prepared to drop a bomb. With the torpedoes unloaded, the crew had no choice but to evade. The Nautilus sank deeper, reaching 100 meters. On board the Fearless, the relentless company manager Crawley extended the fuse to its maximum, preparing to drop another bomb. The crew held their breath, knowing that a direct hit would mean certain destruction. The bomb exploded five meters away, but the Nautilus's iron hull remained intact. However, strange sounds from terrifying deep-sea creatures were detected before the crew could celebrate. Inside the Nautilus, the dog barked frantically at something. Blaster, suspicious, approached a cabin and spotted a pair of guards' boots. Suddenly, a giant squid's tentacle slapped against the window, tightly wrapping around the Nautilus. Captain Nemo tried to start the engines, but they were immobilized. As the tentacles squeezed tighter, the crew felt the looming danger of the submarine's glass shattering. Knowing it was his duty to protect the crew, Nemo decided to test the unproven diving suits. He planned to scare the squid away with a shot rather than confront it directly. The diving suit worked and Nemo climbed to the top of the submarine. As he aimed to shoot, the squid sensed danger and smacked him away. Fortunately, the suit and water cushioned the impact, saving Nemo from injury. However, the Nautilus wasn't as lucky as the squid continued pulling at the hull. In a desperate move, Nemo ran towards a spear gun, but the squid intervened. At that critical moment, the mother whale Nemo had saved earlier returned, grabbing the squid's tentacle and engaging in a tug of war. For the first time, Nemo felt the insignificance of humanity. Luckily, the whale won, biting off the squid's tentacle and driving it away, much to the crew's relief. Returning to the submarine, he was greeted with cheers, but the fearless warship still loomed above. Starting the engines would reveal their location. Nemo devised a plan. He fired a torpedo loaded with noise-making items to distract the warship. The scout on the fearless excitedly took the bait, and Nemo's strategy worked, allowing the Nautilus to escape once again. As the Nautilus prepared to resupply on shore, Lucas noticed the dog tugging at her skirt, signaling something urgent. Blaster had been captured by a guard who had infiltrated their ranks. Lucas remained calm and assured the guard of his safety, leading him to lower his weapon. This guard, who had been accidentally left behind during Nemo's escape, revealed he didn't want to be a soldier and preferred a sailor's life. Nemo, skeptical but persuaded by Lucas, agreed to spare him and promised to release him at the next port. Resupplying presented a challenge. The British Empire's reach meant the East India Company could pursue them anywhere. Nemo suggested an island in Dutch-controlled Indonesia, which had tensions with Britain, making it a potential safe haven. However, the Nautilus's size made it an easy target. Upon landing, they were spotted by local guards. The local lord, Caesar, initially saw Nemo as an ally against Britain, but laughed at the goods offered in trade. Recognizing Nemo as an Indian prince with ties to his father, 
Caesar agreed to provide supplies for free, but needed time. He invited the crew to his palace. Lucas, eager to declare her noble status, and Nemo, curious about his father's past, joined Caesar while some crew stayed behind to guard the Nautilus. The East India Company guard, Cuff, was locked in a dungeon as the crew enjoyed a rare moment of leisure, unaware of a larger scheme at play. Designer Benoit discovered an ancient book in Caesar's library mentioning Atlantis, sparking excitement. Meanwhile, the crew noticed that Caesar's supplies were spoiled. Realizing something was wrong, Kai rushed to the palace. In Caesar's study, Nemo learned that his father had been a minor king in India who was ousted and imprisoned by capitalists. Caesar offered to help Nemo reclaim his father's wealth, and the two found much to discuss. Caesar was thrilled to learn that Lucas was skilled in mechanics, especially since the palace's ice machine was broken. As they headed to the living room, Nemo reflected on his father's legacy. Curious, he sneaked back to Caesar's study to take a photo of his father as a keepsake, but discovered a telegraph machine signaling Caesar's betrayal to the East India Company. Caught in the act, Caesar admitted his treachery, citing British generosity as his motivation. While Nemo was thrown into the dungeon, the crew outside enjoyed a buffet. Rumors of local cannibals made the militia's fierce looks unsettling, but the militia was simply envious of the food they had never tasted despite years of service to Caesar. Meanwhile, Kai discovered the palace's storage room filled with supplies. As Lucas finished her repairs, she heard whispers from beneath the floor and found young girls laboring to move coal in the basement. Moved by their plight, she led them to the buffet, shocking the militia, who were the children's parents, forced into servitude by Caesar. The girl's father signaled them to hold back, but the food temptation was too strong. Having humiliated Nemo and released the East India Company guard Cuff, Caesar arrived at the scene. Outraged by the sight of slaves eating, Caesar threw dirt on their food and ordered the militia to execute their children publicly. Unable to stand by, the crew, led by Jagadish, incited the militia to revolt. Though Caesar doubted their resolve, the militia's anger ignited. After Caesar left, he ordered the guards to open fire, planning to eliminate the crew and the militia in one sweep. As the battle raged, Benoit heard the gunshots and quickly packed the map of Atlantis, preparing to return to the Nautilus. Lucas searched Nemo, but encountered Cuff, who had stolen the prison keys. He allowed Lucas to rescue Nemo while he covered for her. Despite the tension, Lucas and Nemo bickered at the dungeon door. Clumsily trying to pick the lock with a hairpin, Nemo was interrupted by Lucas, who ironically pulled out the key. Meanwhile, the militia, led by the crew, stormed Caesar's palace. Jagadish caught Cuff acting suspiciously, but Cuff claimed to have severed ties with the East India Company, destroying the telegraph machine. However, Jagadish realized a message had already been sent. Cuff, in reality, planned to infiltrate the Nautilus and collaborate with the fearless warship. When Jagadish discovered the truth, he was shot, and Caesar hid in a secret chamber with the wounded Jagadish. Nemo's party regrouped at the harbor, but the fearless warship blocked their escape. Despite some crew members' concerns about leaving Jagadish behind, Nemo made the tough decision to prioritize the Nautilus's safety. However, they were too late, as the fearless had already positioned cannons underwater, firing a warning shot near the Nautilus. Benoit realized the enemy's intent wasn't to destroy the Nautilus, but to force a surrender. Hearing this, Nemo devised a plan to outsmart them. Without a diving suit, Nemo surfaced provocatively, drawing the soldiers' fire. He then dove back underwater, using the Nautilus's propellers to stir up the seabed, creating a cloud of mud that obscured his figure. Surprising the soldiers, Nemo swam to the Fearless's window and began smashing it with an axe, knowing their glass wasn't as strong as the Nautilus's. As the glass shattered, water pressure pushed Nemo out, but the crew in diving suits quickly rescued him back to the Nautilus. Using seabed mud for cover, they broke through the Fearless's blockade. However, due to the missed supplies, they still faced food shortages. Fortunately, the crew began adapting to life on the Nautilus, growing vegetables and fishing to alleviate the crisis. The Nautilus passed through the Strait of Malacca into the Pacific Ocean, beginning its grand adventure. Though fishing provided some food, drinking water was scarce. One day, Nemo led the crew to an unnamed island, searching for fresh water. 
They found dragon fruit trees, and Suyin began picking fruit while Nemo and others searched for water. On shore, the dog inhaled spores, foreshadowing future troubles. Blaster, new to island exploration, wandered off alone and followed a crab, hoping for a meal. He soon realized he had disturbed a giant mother crab, though it only meant to warn him. Relaxing, Blaster then noticed skeletons around him, but Nemo reassured him. As they prepared to leave, they triggered an old ground trap. Though decayed, it still rang an alarm. Meanwhile, nearby soldiers, desperate for food, were about to sacrifice one of their own when they heard the alarm, signaling intruders. Nemo and his group, trapped, struggled to find a way out. Just as tension mounted, a dark figure appeared. The woman, Casimir, rescued them and quickly invited them to her refuge. Moving easily, she revealed she had lived on the island for a long time. Nemo followed Casimir into a foul-smelling cave, only to slip and find themselves inside a huge hollow tree with pursuing soldiers just below. Nemo stayed silent as a venomous spider crawled onto his head. Lucas, surprisingly fearless, picked it up, teased Nemo, and then tossed it down at the soldiers. After overcoming several challenges, they reached Casimir's refuge, where she had grown vegetables and created a freshwater purification system, skills Nemo admired for use on the Nautilus. They quickly agreed to return to the submarine, but Blaster's curiosity led to trouble again. He wandered too far, got frightened by a snake, and accidentally rolled into the path of searching soldiers. Despite being captured and interrogated, he kept the Nautilus's location secret, claiming his boat had capsized. The soldiers, frustrated, decided to sacrifice him to the lake monster. As the soldiers awakened the lake monster, Nemo arrived just in time. However, the soldiers were distracted by Lucas's beauty, giving Casimir a chance to throw down a rope for Blaster to escape. The lake monster emerged, revealing its predatory nature. Just then, their comrades arrived with homemade claymores, which only angered the creature further. With its slimy body, the monster moved quickly on land, but had poor vision giving them a brief reprieve. Nemo hurried everyone back to the Nautilus, but as they fled, a giant eel appeared from the forest, drawn by the submarine's electrical currents. As they started the engine, the eel attacked, entangling the Nautilus and causing it to tilt severely. Worse, the eel began emitting light. It was electric. The powerful discharge sparked all the submarine's electronics, forcing Nemo to shut down the engine to prevent further damage. He then sought ideas from the crew to escape the dire situation. Having grown up with a physicist father, Lucas confidently proposed a plan to deal with electric eel after some complex calculations. While theoretically sound, it was risky. Any mistake could electrocute everyone on board. Nemo supported the plan as long as it didn't damage the engine. Although he considered a daring move, like donning a diving suit to confront the eel, the creature's body had locked the hatch leaving them no choice but to trust Lucas. Meanwhile, the dog had unknowingly spread spores throughout the submarine after encountering them on the island. As the crew focused on electrocuting the eel, the spores began affecting them. When the voltage peaked, the eel remained unaffected and sparks knocked down the crew. Despair set in as symptoms of the spore infection appeared. Designer Benoit blamed Lucas for nearly ruining the engine and argued with Nemo. Trust issues resurfaced, but the housekeeper, Loti, stopped the quarrel. Benoit, frustrated, left, and Lucas, though scorched, promised to fix the situation. The spore virus spread, and Big Beard, losing control, smashed the barometer. Benoit discovered Cuff unconscious after spying on confidential documents, but was more concerned with the map of Atlantis. With Nemo's help, Lucas reassembled the discharge device and tried again, but the outcome was the same. Surprisingly, the eel had voluntarily released its grip. The temperature around the submarine rapidly increased, indicating the eel sensed a greater threat and fled, leaving part of its fin stuck on the Nautilus. As the eel departed, the crew saw a submarine volcano erupting on the ocean floor. Suyin tried to change course, but the helm was jammed by the eel's fin. Nemo called for electrical support, but Lucas was still paralyzed by her earlier failure. The situation worsened when Blaster discovered barrels soaked in nitroglycerin in the torpedo room. If the temperature rose too high, the Nautilus would be destroyed. Blaster couldn't move the barrels alone, so Nemo sent Kai to help while he prepared to don a diving suit to remove the stuck fin. Unbeknownst to him, the spore infection was spreading. As Nemo headed to the diving chamber, 
he hallucinated, seeing his deceased wife and reliving memories of home. Overcome with emotion, he collapsed, unconscious. Meanwhile, Kai and Blaster moved the explosives to cold storage. Blaster noticed infection marks on Kai's hands, but they disappeared in the cold, revealing that the cold could cure the infection. However, if they had moved the crew to cold storage, the Nautilus would have entered the volcano. Lucas eventually rallied herself and found the submarine eerily silent. She discovered that everyone had lost consciousness except Kai, who informed her that lowering the temperature could save the crew. Determined to fix the situation, Lucas decided to don a diving suit and remove the fin while Kai controlled the submarine. Despite her fear, Lucas braved the warm, red waters outside the Nautilus. As she made her way to the front of the submarine, the black infection lines appeared on her face, and she began to feel the effects. She hallucinated about her father's death, but, inspired by his words, found the strength to continue. Fueled by courage, Lucas wiped away her tears and pressed on to save the Nautilus. Enduring the intense heat, Lucas bravely climbed towards the eel's fin, but realized her rope was too short, just five meters away. Without hesitation, she unfastened it, leaving no way back. With a leap, she reached the fin as the Nautilus faced a critical moment. Using all her strength, Lucas removed the fin, allowing the Nautilus to shift direction and narrowly avoid a volcanic waterfall. The impact sent Lucas flying, and she struggled to grasp the Nautilus's smooth hull. Inside, the crew began to recover from the spore infection as the temperature dropped. While they celebrated their survival, Nemo realized Lucas was missing. He ordered the crew to turn back, unwilling to lose her. Fortunately, Lucas was found, but she wasn't breathing, plunging everyone into despair. Designer Benoit refused to give up and used parts from a machine gun to create a makeshift pacemaker. After several attempts, he miraculously revived Lucas, and the crew cheered as Nemo officially welcomed her into the Nautilus crew. After her recovery, Lucas mentioned seeing a strange structure resembling an arc on the ocean floor, which she initially dismissed as a hallucination. But Benoit recognized it as the lost civilization he had been seeking, Atlantis. Though Nemo was skeptical, seeing Lucas's agreement and Benoit's determination, he agreed to the expedition, realizing that exploring the unknown seabed was Benoit's dream, just as revenge was his. A five-person exploration team was formed to investigate Atlantis. Cuff considered fishing during the mission, but Benoit reminded him it was a scientific expedition. Equipped with electric spear guns, they began their journey. As they descended, Benoit confirmed Lucas's earlier sighting. There indeed was an ancient structure, the Atlantis Ark, made of neatly arranged hexagonal stones. They discovered stairs leading to a spacious platform and following the water flow, swam upwards to a new area. The team activated their glow sticks and explored the mysterious surroundings. Giacomo stayed to guard the exit while the others ventured deeper. Lucas identified fossils of crinoids, ancient marine creatures, on the rock walls. However, when Cuff trembled in fear, Lucas realized the crinoids were still alive, clinging to the rocks. Lucas's glove tore in the chaos as she cut through the creatures. Captain Nemo arrived, seeing the crinoids swarming the walls, and ordered an immediate retreat. Despite the danger, Benoit eagerly explored a tunnel. Nemo, trusting Lucas to lead the Nautilus if he didn't return, went after Benoit. Benoit found a glowing stone inside the tunnel, but was interrupted by Nemo. As they hurried back, the glow sticks faded and the crinoids closed in. Just 10 meters from the exit, Benoit tripped and was dragged back by the creatures. Despite his struggle, he gave Nemo a determined look, signaling his acceptance of fate. As Nemo's helmet cracked, the others faced their dangers. A group of unnamed marine creatures attacked the remaining team members, and Lucas's torn glove attracted a shark. Their electric guns became their lifesaver at the critical moment, allowing them to fend off the threats and survive. Nemo staggered out of the tunnel, collapsing from suffocation after holding his breath to escape. In a desperate moment, Giacomo swapped their helmets, helping Nemo back to the Nautilus. Although safe, they had lost Benoit forever. Clutching the stone Benoit had given him, Nemo held on to his friend's dream. The crew mourned deeply, but while sorting through Benoit's belongings, Nemo found a tape recording. In it, Benoit supported Nemo as captain, hoping the ocean's wonders would heal his scarred heart. However, Nemo's thirst for revenge remained. He 
He planned to find a Spanish fleet's treasure near the Arctic to arm the Nautilus and strike back at the East India Company. As Nemo discussed the Arctic with Lucas, a cannon shot rang out. The fearless warship was pursuing them again. Nemo ordered full speed ahead and attempted a risky drift dive to trap the Fearless on a glacier. The maneuver nearly failed as the Nautilus crashed into the ice, but the Fearless fared worse, becoming stuck in the Arctic with jammed propellers. The Nautilus also sustained damage, and Nemo realized they needed the Fearless's forge for repairs. Forced to negotiate, Nemo proposed a trade, use of the forge in exchange for freeing the Fearless. Captain Youngblood agreed, but added a condition. He wanted Lucas, whose fiancé was on the Fearless, included in the deal. Nemo refused, insisting Lucas could choose for herself. Reluctantly, Nemo returned to the submarine, unsure if Lucas would stay or go. As part of the deal, the crew tied chains to the Fearless, facing mocking from the soldiers, who claimed they were destined to be laborers. The tension between the two sides intensified. While Lucas went to the forge to repair a part, Captain Youngblood and Nemo organized a snow cricket match to ease tensions between their crews. Despite being a sport for British royalty, Nemo's crew outplayed the soldiers. Meanwhile, Lucas faced challenges of her own. She had never met her fiancé. Her mother arranged their engagement, leading to awkward conversations in the forge. Pitt, who believed women shouldn't work with hammers, tried to converse with Lucas, but was dismissed. Frustrated, he joined the cricket game, only to cause his team to lose. After finishing the repair, Lucas decided to return to the Nautilus and continue exploring. However, Pitt disagreed, believing Lucas was already his due to the dowry he paid. He forced Lucas back to her room and insisted she join him for dinner. But Lucas, changed by her underwater adventures, refused. The housekeeper, who had initially escorted Lucas to her wedding, also rebelled and stabbed Pitt in the foot, helping Lucas escape. Meanwhile, Nemo, preparing to attach the chains to the Fearless, hesitated, hoping to see Lucas. Due to the truce, the soldiers didn't dare fire, so Lucas and the housekeeper used ropes to slide to the ice and return to the Nautilus. As the submarine's engine started, it dragged the Fearless from the glacier. As they escaped, Pitt, furious, ordered the soldiers to fire on the Nautilus. Captain Youngblood mocked Pitt for breaking the truce, but Pitt, consumed by humiliation, didn't care. He fired a cannon, but the unlit fuse only caused a small dent in the Nautilus. Youngblood then stopped Pitt with a pistol before he could fire again. Once the truce was broken, Nemo assumed the Fearless had betrayed them. In anger, he grabbed a hammer and went on deck to break the chain holding the Nautilus. Soldiers began shooting, but Nemo dodged bullets and successfully unchained the submarine, escaping back on board. To entirely evade the Fearless, Nemo made a daring decision to cross the Arctic Glacier. They would be trapped beneath the ice if they didn't reach the other side before their oxygen ran out. As eerie ghost ships loomed nearby, the crew grew uneasy. Nemo reassured them they had enough oxygen for six days, but the crew remained skeptical. Feeling his authority challenged, Nemo insisted they follow orders, forgetting that his rebellious crew might revolt. He was disarmed and confined to his room as the first officer took over as captain. The crew decided to return home, planning to sell the Nautilus and split the money once they were out of the Arctic. Lucas recognized that Nemo's desire for revenge had clouded his judgment, preventing him from considering the crew's well-being. She challenged him to name each crew member and their backstory, but Nemo fell silent, realizing he couldn't. As the first officer took command, a new crisis emerged. The Arctic magnetic field disrupted the compass and instruments, causing the submarine to sink uncontrollably. Worse, a leak was discovered in the torpedo room, initially blamed on the fearless cannonball. However, the true culprit was iron-eating beetles, posing a more significant threat. Nemo had a loyal supporter, Giacomo, who used a shift change to sideline Suyin and free Nemo. Recognizing his mistake, Nemo donned a diving suit to inspect the breach, realizing a cannonball didn't cause it. As he examined it, a strange insect crawled out, startling him. He nearly slipped off the hull, but managed to hold on. He saw that the Nautilus was perched on the edge of a cliff, with a glowing plankton strip below, indicating a possible escape route. However, the Nautilus was losing balance due to the magnetic field and the leak. Nemo rushed back to show the crew that iron-eating beetles, not a cannonball, caused the breach. 
The beetles quickly spread throughout the submarine, with a giant female beetle leading them. The crew realized that eliminating her could stop the infestation. As the beetles advanced toward the engine room, Kai and the housekeeper used primitive methods to delay them. Nemo armed himself with a homemade steam sprayer and bravely entered the torpedo room. He attacked the female beetle, causing the others to retreat to protect her. Covered in beetles, Nemo urged the crew to focus on the female. Poet Turin tried to tackle her, but the first officer, Boniface, cleverly used a magnet needle to lure her. Boniface stuffed the female beetle into a torpedo, and as the other beetles followed, he launched it. The torpedo struck a rock, and the explosion eradicated all the beetles, saving the Nautilus. With the beetle crisis resolved, the crew shifted focus to escaping the Arctic's magnetic field. Nemo proposed a daring plan. If all crew members gathered on the bridge, they could unbalance the Nautilus, causing it to fall into the bioluminescent plankton strip and use nature's force to escape the magnetic field's control. To gain the crew's trust, Nemo revealed his true identity. He was a prince from India, and the East India Company had murdered his wife and daughter to seize his family's wealth, imprisoning him as part of their scheme. His story resonated with the crew, many of whom had also suffered at the hands of the company. They reintroduced themselves, reaffirming their commitment to Nemo's cause. As Nemo and Boniface embraced, the submarine's balance shifted, and the Nautilus plunged off the cliff, speeding through the Arctic. The waters were filled with skulls when they reached their destination, signaling danger. The crew cautiously proceeded, discovering the underwater Spanish fleet and the treasure-laden seabed. As they explored, a grand scene unfolded with tall stone pillars resembling a hidden paradise. Nemo, leading the search, found an ancient ship, but the treasure chests were empty, and the skeletons appeared lifeless until they were suddenly attacked. Nemo awoke to find himself and the crew captives of a tribe led by a woman claiming to be Freya's guardian. This tribe of women had guarded the underwater treasure for generations, killing any who dared to seek it. The skulls they had seen earlier were warnings to outsiders like them. As the crew faced execution, Nemo struggled and shouted, invoking the tribal law he had read about, criminals have the right to defend themselves. The queen agreed to a defense ritual to entertain the warriors and allow them to investigate the Nautilus. Despite their grim situation, Nemo noted that the tribe had salvaged the treasure they sought. From the decorations to the queen's ruby, everything held immense value. Meanwhile, two tribal warriors infiltrated the Nautilus, where Suyin and Blaster detected them. Though outmatched, Suyin fought fiercely, aided by Doggy. When Blaster threw her the safe's key, Suyin retrieved a firearm unfamiliar to the warriors, forcing them to retreat. Nemo began his defense, arguing that his quest for the treasure was to fight the East India Company and free India from colonial rule. The crew supported him, urging the queen to see the world beyond their isolation, where their wealth could buy power. Though the queen was almost convinced, she sentenced them to death. As the warriors raised their spears, Nemo and the crew broke free, sparking a chaotic battle. The crew, familiar with surface combat, gained the upper hand and even began looting the tribe's treasure. Nemo urged them to escape by jumping off a waterbound cliff, knowing it wouldn't be fatal. As they fled, the desperate queen threw a shield, injuring Cuff. She captured Nemo, but he seized her ruby and jumped off the cliff. In the water, Nemo saw Cuff struggling. Though he dropped the ruby, he chose to save Cuff, prioritizing his friend's life over the gem. The crew's actions enraged the queen, who activated a mechanism to seal off the area, intending to trap the Nautilus and sever all contact with the outside world. Furious over Nemo's theft of treasures and harm to her warriors, she triggered a series of collapsing pillars, causing massive waves. The Nautilus navigated the chaos, narrowly escaping the queen's wrath. Though they lost the ruby, the diamonds Turin brought back were enough to arm the Nautilus for revenge against the East India Company. Soon, the company's manager learned the Nautilus had entered London waters and prepared defenses, unaware that Nemo was planning a more subtle attack. Instead of brute force, Nemo manipulated the stock market. He spread false rumors of the company's bankruptcy due to the Nautilus, causing panic and strikes. As the stock plummeted, Nemo took advantage, dividing and conquering. 
He and a former classmate convinced a major shareholder to surrender shares by claiming they found a diamond mine in India. First mate Boniface stole share certificates from another shareholder. At the same time, Lucas, disguised in a swollen dress, tricked major shareholder Pitt into signing a share transfer agreement, thinking it was a marriage contract. At the East India Company's emergency shareholder meeting, Nemo boldly arrived with his crew. The manager tried to call the guards, but Nemo presented the share certificates. The crew confirmed their shareholder status, leaving the manager powerless. As the new majority shareholder, Nemo used his power to dismiss the East India Company's manager and executives. Attending as an observer, Pitt believed Nemo couldn't control over 50% of the shares without his support. However, Lucas betrayed Pitt, leaving him both wifeless and penniless. Now the largest shareholder, Nemo disbanded the guard squad and announced the company's dissolution, surprisingly supported by Captain Youngblood, who longed to retire. As the guards handed over their weapons, the manager made a desperate last stand, attempting to shoot Nemo. The crew quickly subdued him. With his revenge complete, Nemo also won Lucas's love. Nemo then forced the manager to end the taxation of Indian colonies and release imprisoned laborers. He raided the company's vault, taking treasures and a familiar stone similar to one from Atlantis. He burned the company's confidential documents. Preparing to leave, Nemo told Lucas to stay on land, fearing the British Empire's pursuit. Lucas, upset by his decision, left in a huff. As Nemo returned to the Nautilus, Lucas re-encountered Pitt, who attempted to force marriage at gunpoint. Fortunately, the housekeeper intervened, injuring Pitt. Despite Nemo's objections, Lucas decided to rejoin the Nautilus. As one crisis ended, another began. The dismissed manager, Crawley, ordered the fearless battleship to attack the Nautilus. Captain Youngblood, now free, refused, forcing Crawley to threaten a guard to compel compliance. Reluctantly, the soldiers launched an attack, but Nemo's upgrades allowed the Nautilus to withstand the assault. Crawley ordered the cannons to fire as the submarine escaped, but the Nautilus's armor held firm. Knowing the Royal Navy could be alerted, Nemo had planned. Blaster and another crew member planted explosives on the bridge to cut off the Fearless's pursuit. Crawley, seeing this, ordered the soldiers to shoot, but Captain Youngblood intervened and was shot by Crawley. As the bridge collapsed, the Nautilus rescued the two crew members. Though some suggested waiting for Lucas, the crew agreed it was too dangerous. Lucas arrived at the port, only to see the Nautilus disappearing, fueling her determination to rejoin them. Elsewhere, Crawley was killed by Cuff, repaying a debt to Nemo. Cuff, a spy, had gathered the Nautilus's design plans, excluding the core engine, hoping to build a replica. Meanwhile, Nemo sensed something as the stones collided, realizing that designer Benoit might still be alive in Atlantis. Sharing this with his crew, Nemo decided they must return to Atlantis to rescue a friend and seek treasures to fight the British Empire. This concludes the first season of Nautilus. Thanks for watching our recap. If you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe to keep up with our exciting movie journeys. Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments. See you next time.